All right, welcome, welcome, welcome humans and gentle humans to San Francisco's first ever Cliterary Salon. Uh, and now without any further ado, I'm going to introduce the first writer, um, Lauren Parker. Uh, when you see Lauren standing on the stage, her hands are clenched in fists of rage. No angel born in hell can break her witch's spell. Um, because she's a literal witch, humans and gentlemen. Uh, so don't cross her unless you enjoy hopping around on all fours and going ribbon. I'm sorry, I'm being informed that literally everything I just said is offensive to witches. So without any further ado, and before I put my foot in my mouth again, I give you Lauren Parker, everybody! that my tits are not out and that I did not crack my head on that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So this is called San Francisco Restaurant Week. Can everybody hear me? Uh -huh. yes. Yes. Okay. My lover has no microwave, but she has a pasta maker. She rolls the dough between her palms in the kitchen of her San Francisco studio. She shares the bathroom with the whole floor, but she says it's worth it to have the kitchen. She has a mini fridge, a single burner that can only be used when the window is open, and a pot with a copper bottom. She asks to cook for me. I bring wine. Her fingers move slowly, cracking the eggs on top of the snowy flour and flicking the sunny yolk with a fork, her wrists twitching like a cat's tail. She drags her nails against the plank of the wood from the Ikea bookcase she set on a stool and uses as a counter space as she kneads and folds the dough. Her grandmother emigrated from Hungary, but lived in an Italian neighborhood in Hartford. The ravioli are sacred. The steps are written on a tattered recipe card stained in olive oil and pressed fragments of basil. My grandmother taught me to make them so one day I could get a nice girl to love and marry me. All because of the ravioli, she says. Pricking the thin skin, keeping a tomato together with the fine tip of a steak knife. We share the look. The look that says, it's too soon to feel like this but we are saying it in our own ways. I'm swinging my hips to the rhythm of I love you, and she's sharing her grandmother's ravioli. She shows her affection by being useful, showing that she, what she can do for me, how she can love me. It's in the crinkles around her eyes and the thrust of her palm into the marigold lump of dough, crusted in the lacy, loose flour. Watching her is art, as her hands dip, dust, and soothe the messy, all-purpose flour that looks so fetal. It could be bread, it could be pie crust, it could be anything. But tonight it will be delicate, blooming ravioli drizzled in a butter and rosemary cream sauce. She cuts portions of dough and flattens them with the heel of her hand, rolling her palm over top of it so that her love line and lifeline are preserved. She runs the flattened slab of starch over the metal slats of her pasta maker, whipping the hand crank around and around until a long gossamer swath of ravioli crepe lays on the wooden plank. She uses a spoon to brighten the filling and artfully stuff the dough, pressed so thin it looks like a pane of stained glass. It's late now, the process slow for inexperienced cooks, so we'll eat at midnight. The pasta maker is a splurge purchase, but the cutting wheel is her grandmother's, and it whistles as it cuts through the stuffed serpentine dough, catching the beat of the water boiling in the single burner, the open window pouring in the sound of the city, the cutter leaves scalloped sapphic edges, pressed together with two layers of thin pasta like lips puckering or hands touching. The water babbles and coos, and she pours salt into the pot like a Greek maiden pouring wine into gaping chalices. The upstairs neighbor is vacuuming, banging into walls and furniture, <laughs> and I open the wine. It's a red that costs more than $10, which is a stretch for me. <laughs> but I, too, have something to prove. I breathe with the wine, the alveoli in my lungs opening to accept the olive oil, the sour creaminess of ricotta, herbs I can't name but that remind me of a garden in a book I read as a child. The secret is to mix in a little bit of goat cheese to bring out the tanginess, she says, taking a sip of her wine. We are held around that Ikea piece of particle board with large streaks of laminate scraped off by a knife or spatula. Our heads are near touching, and it's a meal that settles into the chest as well as the stomach, pouring warmth through the frostbitten parts of your insides where stress and doubt have been allowed to reside. 
We eat each other as greedily as our handiwork, trading caresses like recipes, kissing like flicks of a paring knife. Her body amazes me, the scoop of her lower back, the riverbed between her breasts, the basin of her hips, her cock a coiled root vegetable. The hearty warmth of food that keeps winter misery at bay. Her teeth are a fork pressed into my shoulders, and we try to not kick over plates or up into the table when we fall into her bed. We emerge stained in sauces, too intimate to write down the steps, but I try to remember them as clearly as I remember the care she takes when stuffing the flowering ravioli, the gentle lowering of a slotted spoon into turning water, salty like the sea. Dust settles after infatuation, and we go from spending nights wrapped in each other in the hazy intoxication of brie on day-old bread and blueberry balsamic on vanilla ice cream to long portions of quiet and store-bought gnocchi and sauce. When she offers to order in, my heart breaks. And every time she doesn't offer to make ravioli, I hear, you aren't the woman I want to keep. Something has arisen, a tension, a gaminess that spoils the meal. Unkind. I clutch my worst traits to my breast, creating space between us as all the nutrients hit my bitterness first. She says I taste different with a look on her face that means the dish didn't turn out right. Our love affair is no longer in season, the air too cold, the ground too hard, and I started buying wine that's less than ten dollars. We part without breaking up like lesbians often do. <laughs> So much of our communication is unsaid, and we just know it's time to stop texting, to wind down, to meet quarterly for lunch and pageantry. We don't cook anymore, but we still have wine. She meets someone, I meet someone, we talk about them too much for comfort. We are too excited for one another to be believed. She eats salads, and I pretend to still be working on the perfect vegetable marinade, as if olive oil could ever really be topped for boiled vegetables. <laughs> we fuck again, like flipping through a scrapbook. Six seasons have gone by and my body has forgotten hers, like ingredients in a foreign language. Was it mandorla for pine nuts? No, no, it was panoli. I think. I grope around in my memory for snatches of pleasure, but fucking her is like taking up an old passion with new inspiration and finding your wrist ill-suited to hold a paintbrush. After I make pesto, Grind herbs, butter bread, pour wine, grate hard cheese, squeezing the rind between my knuckles. My feet are planted. I am ready for what she has to say, stirring the sauce too frequently so that the basil bruises. She will breathe sharply and say, I have no more use for this, for you. I am convinced I am ready for it, this monologue of parting. But she doesn't say it, just sips Prosecco from the only wine glass I own and I boil for folly. My feet stay planted until she kisses me goodbye. I ask her to stay, but she scolds me. Ah, never order off the menu. Her kiss is sweet, but flat, like the hardened clumps of aged garlic on the windowsill or rice left on the stove too long. I drink her leftover wine, eat the pesto leaning against the sink. She has left the stained recipe card behind on the pillow the olive oil and basil stains creating filigree around the ancient cursive swirls of a Hungarian grandma grandmother's handwriting. I try to make it myself. It's better than sex. <laughs> Thank you.